Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and the penultimate show in our Eastern Front Week, our second or possibly our third Eastern Front Week since we began about a year and a half ago. And following yesterday's somewhat harrowing but really informative show about the Red Army kind of brutalizing their way across Central Europe today, we are looking at what happened kind of in the other direction. The Germans who were taken prisoner by the Red Army and taken back to the Soviet Union, what happened to them, why they were taken there, where they were spread out, and more as well. And by the way, before we get into introducing my guest, if you are a new visit, uh, viewer, please don't forget to click like. Don't forget to share what we're doing with other people. Leave us a comment after the show. Try and watch all the shows all the way through to the end. It all helps with the algorithm and maybe even consider becoming a patron or a member of the channel. And as usual, don't forget to open up that description on YouTube. And that's where all your links are, the links to merchandise, uh, the websites of my guests, the books of my guests, where you can find other shows in on World War II TV that cover similar subjects. Pulling back that description, opening up is your friend. That's where the information is. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest. Dr. Susan Grunewald is a digital historian, and we'll find out what that is in Pittsburgh. And her particular forte is looking at uh, what happened to these prisoners and digital mapping. So without further ado, I will bring Susan in, who has a very slick professional setup. It's really good. We're not, you know, we've had show people come to doing it from their bathrooms, their, their sheds. We've even had on occasions, but we're in a studio today. So good afternoon, Susan. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me with you. Well, it's great. So as I said there, German POWs, and I think it's one of those things that probably a lot of people watching have some ideas of what happened to them. The imagery has already come into their brains there. We think of the, the gulags, we think of the cold and the and the, and all that there. And we're going to bust some myth, myth, bust some myths about what happened to them. But before we do that, I talked about this digital history. Digital, what is a digital historian for those who don't know? <laughs> Well, a digital historian is not somebody who's drastically different from a traditional historian. Um, I still do the majority of my work in archives, for example. I read a lot of published or unpublished primary sources, um, and I engage heavily with secondary source literature as well. But what I'm using is I, I'm taking computers and computer software, and I'm using them to help me reinvestigate traditional sources. Uh, for example. So I've done a lot with, and I'm going to talk about this and show you some of this in my presentation today, but I've done a lot with mapping uh, where German prisoner of war camps were. Um, and I've taken that information from archival sources and just placed them into a map to see a spatial layout of that to, to, to visualize and re-examine and recontextualize the information that is in a new way that you might not necessarily see just looking at documents on paper. Um, and I've also read a bunch of memoirs and done some computer uh, processing through the memoirs so that the computer can do like a large scale reading of documents that I, as a single human, can't process the same way. So it's essentially taking data and, and extrapolating things from it that the human mind finds difficult to do. And we had that, of course, came up with Dr. Philip Blood and his um, uh, mapping of, of Poland and the war crimes there committed by the Luftwaffe. Luftwaffe. It was He was able to look at... Um, uh, um, repetition and, and and things and repeated um, uh, the word I'm look, looking for is not coming to my brain there, but things anomalies and things like that that that, that, that mapping can 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 produce that perhaps you just reading archives can't. Anyway, that is interesting, and it, we we talk about a lot on the channel about this new generation of historians that are going to have a lot more tools at their disposal. We are, of course, talking about the final years of the people who survived World War II being able to share their memoirs with us. But the digital archives, the ability to zoom in on aerial photos, the, the sharing of resources between countries, we've never been in a better position. So the, the next generation will have a whole lot more tools at their disposal. So we, we, we're kind of excited to see what's going to happen. But you have come armed with a PowerPoint that we'll bring up on screen there. And folks, what we will do is we will do it the usual way. Questions that kind of pertain to exactly what Susan is talking about at the moment, we'll kind of deal with them as we go along. Any kind of really broad, maybe philosophical questions, like could they have done something different? We'll do those kind of ones at the end maybe. But um, I'm looking forward to sit back and learn. I hope we will all have some myths bust. And um, over to you basically, Susan. All right. So thank you very much again for letting me be here and share my work with you. Um, I'm going to talk today, very brief overview about German prisoners of war in the Soviet Union, this concept of Siberia and what Siberia means for, well, both those of us in the Western world, but also especially in Germany vis-a-vis -vis this uh, 
historical episode. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about myth busting related to the Gulag and the German prisoners war. So to just kick everything off, um, my research broadly looks at German prisoners of war in the Soviet Union over the course of World War II and after the Second World War. Um, so the final German prisoners of war, the last few thousand, were released in 1956, which was 11 years after the end of the Second World War and seven years longer than any of the other allied victor nations held on to their prisoners for. Um, and so the main concern of my research is why. Why were they held for so long? Um, and I assert that ultimately it's due to the economic needs of the Soviet Union um, and the, the, the massive destruction of the Second World War to specifically the Soviet Union. Now, there certainly is an aspect of punishment and retribution in terms of holding them for so long, right? It's not that there's no punishment involved, but it is that economics outweighed punishment in terms of the reasoning behind why they should be held for so long. And to jump in, that that's going to be the thing that is going to be blowing people's minds, I think, because especially we just talked before going live about yesterday's show being very raw and very visceral and talk, you know, listening to harrowing accounts of rape survivors. When you get to the Eastern Front, front emotion and revenge and retribution are kind of the words that kind of appear to tie everything together. They did that, this to us, so we're going to do this to them is a kind of swinging back and forth, seemingly common, common denominator of the Eastern Front. An economy and the economics behind things seems to sit somewhere much further down the list in the way we perceive the Eastern Front. So I'm really looking forward to, to, to getting to grips with this. So I, I just thought I'd throw that in there at the beginning is a bit of just how how we think of certain things. There are certain words we think of, like in the word association, retribution, punishment, revenge are words that come in. But I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, of course. Um, and I, I just, you know, slight digression uh, as to where I was planning on, on heading with this. But based on what you just said, um, I think it's important that you brought this up right now, especially for Germans, Germans who lived through this, Germans who had relatives who lived through this, the only thing that they understand is the notion of retribution, right? That's mm. what made sense to them as well to process this. Um, but, and this is a nice segue to my next slide, what I talk about in my research is that the Soviet authorities really needed these Germans because of the economic destruction of the Second World War. Uh, even the Nazi general uh, Stuttnagel allegedly told Hitler a period of 25 years, that is the time Russia will need to restore what has been destroyed. This was written allegedly during the war. Um, and this is just a, a, a snapshot from the Battle of Stalingrad. Um, so one major city that was leveled during the war, but much of the Soviet territory that had been occupied by Nazi forces looked like this. Um, the Soviet Union, despite the merge from the Second World War as a losing power, um, and due to the burgeoning Cold War, they kept this very much a secret. Uh, it wasn't until very recently that, uh, well, under the Gorbachev era, that the official death statistics were released. Um, and estimates are at about 27 million Soviet citizens uh, were killed in the, in the Second World War. So about 7 million soldiers and 20 million civilians. Uh, that's way more than the other nations all combined. Uh, the major combatant nations, um, and the Soviet Union lost about a quarter of its total physical assets during the war. So when left with the idea of how to rebuild, um, Soviet authorities decided that the German prisoners of war would be a useful additional labor source amidst all of this human death, amidst all of this economic destruction. Um, at the end of the Second World War, Soviet officials had uh, about three million Germans, that's rough ethnic Germans, I, I don't mean to say uh, like Axis powers, um, that's excluding Austrians, Hungarians, so on and so forth. But about 3 million Germans were in Soviet hands at capitulation in May of 1945. And by December of 1945, the number was down to a million and a half. So about a million and a half Germans were uh, released or, or unfortunately died during this time period. Um, but this shows that Soviet authorities were only interested in retaining men who were physically able to partake in post-war reconstruction. And that's what they did. Now, a lot of this forced labor of the Soviet prisoners of uh, German prisoners of war in the Soviet Union is not unknown to Germans, right? Especially if they had a relative came home, if the relative was able and willing to talk about it, they would mention how they labored. Uh, and it's not unusual, actually, for uh, 
it's not unusual in the context of the Second World War that German captives had been used for forced labor. Um, German captives were used for labor in those who were held in the United States, in those who were held in England, and those who were held in France also labored. So it's not a unique circumstance that the Soviet authorities used their captives for labor. What was unique was the extent to which they used them. Um, and what my work does that sort of is a break with some of the traditional German literature on the topic is one is to use uh, Russian language sources, and the other is to talk about the German prisoner of war forced labor in the context of the overall vast system of forced labor that uh, was across the entire Soviet Union. Now, there is no nothing more famous than the Gulag prison camp system. So I look at the German prisoners of war in the context of this gulag prison camp system that, that served as the model for how to organize the prisoner of war labor as well. Much of what we know about the gulag system comes from uh, the Soviet dissident writer, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who himself had been a prisoner in the gulag. Um, he was a political prisoner. There were also criminal prisoners in the system. Uh, I'm not trying to discredit him as a source or say that his writings are wrong, um, but I, what I do want to say is that if you read his works, there's probably uh, an image of Siberia that's just burned in your brain that's synonymous with the gulag, that there's cold and snow and suffering. Um, that, that mindset, that trope is so popular, it even was part of the most recent Muppets movie. Uh, so in the Muppets Most Wanted, there's a whole plot line where Kermit, goes to a gulag, and if you look closely at the, at the image, it identifies it as a gulag, and its only location is Siberia, Russia. Uh, so there's this, this really um, big trope that gulags were only in Siberia. And we just have to, to have a pause there to mention, after 500 and some other show, this is, I think, <laughs> the first official reference to the Muppets with regards to historical uh, understanding of World War II. So well done, Susan, for breaking ground on that. That's an that's a, that's a incredible feat there. You'll get some kind of medal for that, I think. I'm, I'm happy to do my part, uh, spreading the love of the Muppets and gulags. You know, it's all in a day's work. Um, but... So there's been a bunch of recent scholarship looking at the gulag system, uh, which has only been able to be accomplished after the collapse of the Soviet Union. A lot of these uh, formerly secret archives were declassified and people could look into topics that were taboo, especially the crimes of Stalin. So recent mapping work, again, has looked at the gulag system. And if you look at this map, you'll see that the camps were not just in Siberia, that they were across much of the Soviet Union. You need to move, your, map, move your image on. Oh, sorry. There we go. Too many screens. So if you look at this map, you'll see that um, the camps are not across the, or are not just in Siberia. They're at they're across the entire Soviet Union. Um, some of these camps were larger than others, so this map can give a slightly misleading uh, portrayal, but these are uh, the main administration bases of the camps that operated. Um, and this map is from 1949, 1950, which was one of the larger year, one of the years of a uh, high population count in the post-war era. So the same body that ran the Gulag, the NKVD, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, they also ran the Gulag camps. So the Gulag is a Russian acronym that stands for Glavnaya Upravlenia Lagri, or uh, Chief Administration of Camps. The NKVD also ran the GUPV, or uh, the Chief Administration of Prisoners of War and Internees. So it was a parallel organization, the, the Gupfi, uh, that drew on a lot of the previous experience that the NKVD had from running the Gulag. Um, these, this, these, these years of previous experience taught the NKVD how to house people, how to feed people, the, the minimum amount of rations that you could feed them to sustain them, to keep them working. Because there was a very complex calculus going on, especially in the wartime and post-war years where the Soviet economy was in ruins. Um, the free Soviet population was starving and had to deal with rationing as well. There was a famine in 1946 and 1947 that's not very well known about outside of the Soviet Union. Um, so a lot of things that Germans have potentially um, interpreted as intentional uh, policy on the, on the part of the Soviets um, isn't necessarily an intentional policy, but a result of the 
horrible situation that everybody faced in the Soviet Union at the time, right? Um, there wasn't medicine to give to the free population. Naturally, there'd be problems giving medicine to prisoners in the camp system um, because in the socialist centrally planned allo allocation system, right, the, the prisoners are at a lower level uh, than the free population. However, German prisoners of war at times were treated better or were supposed to be, in theory, treated better than uh, some free citizens and certainly better than uh, criminals in the gulag system. What I mean by that is, uh, well, there are two things I want to talk about related to that. One is that there is this, it, it's well known, it's a fact that the Soviet Union did not sign the Geneva Convention, for mm -hmm. example. That doesn't mean that they weren't inspired by it, though, or, or uh, influenced by it. Uh, so. Um, the Soviet authorities had their own thing, which was called the Provision for Prisoners of War that was heavily modeled on the Geneva Convention and followed it almost point by point by point. Scholars of the Geneva Convention in the Soviet Union don't agree as to why the Soviets didn't assign, uh, uh, agree to sign it and uphold it. But regardless of that conflict, Soviet officials tried to follow the baseline international standards. Um, and so, for example, there are stipulations in the Geneva Convention that officers don't have to perform labor, whereas enlisted men do. Officers are supposed to have different rations than enlisted men, and that you're also supposed to feed your captives um, on par with how you feed uh, the, the same rank within your military, right? Mm. So if the Soviet authorities have a standard bread ration of X number of grams a day for an enlisted man, the same level of enlisted men who's a German captive was also supposed to get that ration level. Things didn't always work out the way that they were supposed to. Again, there was a famine, for example, but both the memoir literature, returnee interviews, and Soviet official documents show that over the course of the war, rations were increased as the situation stabilized in the Soviet Union and after the end of the war as well, as the economy slowly recovered, treatment of the prisoners improved. So again, it's not just punishment purely for punishment's sake. There is an attempt to fit some of the international norms. And just the to jump thing... in, I think we, we need to remind ourselves generally of how the breadbasket of the world is empty in that late 40s period. I mean, it came up when we talked about the displacement camps on, on World War II TV and, and the, you know, the accusations that Eisenhower wasn't treating people, the prisoners of war well enough and things like that. There just wasn't any food to go around. I mean, every, everything had been stripped. I mean, where I live in France, some of the fields here couldn't be worked for several years because they've been overworked for the five years of occupation. Well, we repeat that across Europe and, and, and in, uh, into Eastern Europe. I mean, there just there wasn't a lot left. So it's not until the early 50s that the, the world can kind of breathe again and start to get back to normal in just terms of being able to produce food. So I think just to, to stop and remind ourselves how, how there was nothing spare in that period anywhere is worth worth stating, I think. Well, not just overworked. Um, the Eastern Front, both the Wehrmacht and the Red Army practiced scorched earth yeah, policies yeah. when retreating, right? So if they had to cede any land, they wanted to make sure that whoever was taking the land couldn't get anything from it. Um, Soviet uh, there were these special commissions that were done at the end of the war that looked in to assess the damages. And they, they had accountings of how many farms were destroyed, how many tons of machinery were broken, and so on and so forth. They also had figures for how many animals had been slaughtered or sent back to Germany. Um, so there really was nothing there. Um, the, the production was at such a low level compared to its pre-war um, totals that it was not, again, an intentional policy, but as it was just a, a result of, of um, the actual facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as I mentioned, the, the gulag camps are everywhere. The prisoners are in them are uh, the same. Uh, sorry. So gulag camps are, are across the Soviet Union and they serve as the model for the prisoner of war camps, right? And so one of the main focal points of the gulag is that it was designed to be a prison camp system that would also bring economic utility to the state. Um, so a lot of gulag camps were tasked with either extractive mining projects uh, in harsh, inhospitable places where people, where free citizens wouldn't go, or they partook in these massive monumental building projects. And so once the war was over, especially, Soviet officials used the 
the years of experience of mobilizing forced labor to again mobilize German prisoner of war forced labor, but for reconstruction efforts. Um, and um, Stalin himself would assign at times contingents of prisoners of war to industries, to cities, to, to enterprises that he thought were the most important for reconstruction, right? There's one point where Stalin assigns a couple thousand prisoners of war to a particular coal mine area, and he assigns a certain number of prisoners of war to a particular city for reconstruction. So the top highest levels of the Soviet government saw the economic utility of these men and concerned themselves with dictating where they would go. They also frequently received either quarterly or annual reports that assessed the physical condition of the prisoners of war and the main uh, economic commissariats to which they were assigned. Uh, so this was not something that, again, was purely punishment for punishment's sake. It was very much connected to the economic redevelopment of the Soviet Union. Now, Despite the fact that the Soviet Union was a centrally planned economy, there is not a central accounting of prisoner of war labor statistics, or at least that is declassified. <laughs> there are still a handful of documents that are classified. Um, one of the things I get asked about, and I'm sure somebody will ask me this today, is about the death statistics, death rates of the prisoners of war. I frankly do not have a good answer, and that's partially because any of the files that are related to that are still classified. Right. So, after my initial archival foray and I found out that there weren't central accountings of the statistics of the economic contribution of the prisoners of war, I turned to digital methods to see if there's a different way that I could assess that. Uh, and so miraculously, there is this uh, encyclopedia, the places of detention of uh, German prisoners of war in the Soviet Union. It's a German book that was a joint Russian-German research team. They went into the Russian state military archive and they produced an encyclopedia that listed all the camps. So I, this book lists about 4,000 separate forced labor camps or forced labor sites that operated throughout this GUPV uh, prisoner of war labor camp system. And so I scanned this book because despite the fact that it was published in 2010, neither the Russians nor the Germans had a digital copy of it. So I had to mm. scan it, turn the PDF back into machine readable text. Um, and I worked with a programmer to write a script to ask Google Maps for the approximate coordinates of where the camps were based on the name, right? So the, the, the book was organized by the Republic and then a region and then a city and then a village, right? So it would say Armenia, then Yerevan, then a village, or it would say Russia, Moscow, uh, Krasnogorsk, and so on and so forth. So I asked Google to give me some of these coordinates. It took a really long time, but ultimately I was able to produce a map, which you see here, that shows uh, this distribution roughly of the 4,000 camps that operated across the Soviet Union from 1941 to 1956. Uh, and I've just doing this mapping automatically gave me some, some new thoughts about researching the, the camps and also busted a couple of myths initially for me as well, right? So if you look at the map, you'll see that the majority of the camps are not in Russia, uh, excuse me, not in Siberia. They're in the European part of Russia. They're in the European republics of the Soviet Union. So like the Baltics, Belarus, Ukraine, so on and so forth. So there's a correlation between where the camps were and the sites that were destroyed by the fighting of the Second World War. Um, there's also a correlation between the camps and population centers, uh, and that becomes a little bit more striking on this next map as well, right? Because when you're zoomed out on the maps, um, the, the points tend to sort of stack together and you lose some of the, the idea of the spread of the camps. But again, here, if I just zoom in on, you know, the Moscow region, Leningrad, you can see how widespread some of those camps were. And so that's another myth that's sort of busted as well, right? So the camps aren't in Siberia. Instead, the camps are in major population and industrial centers. There are camps in close proximity to the sites of Soviet society. It's not something that's closed and cut off and remote. It's something that a large number of Russian citizens, Soviet citizens, Ukrainian citizens, Belarusians, and so on and so forth, they could have been easily interacting with these uh, German captives. They could have seen these German captives. And indeed, uh, that holds true for me. Uh, the whole reason I got into this project was uh, I taught English in Russia for a year after I finished college. Uh, and the city I taught in is Ulyanovsk, uh, 
It's on the Volga River. It's between uh, Kazan and Samara. It's not in Siberia. It's European Russia. It's Lenin's hometown. He was born and spent a first 15, 17 years of his life growing up there. It was not by any means close to the front lines of the Second World War. And the university I worked for, their migration service building was in the center of town. And one day I was handing in my passport to do the migration control paperwork. And the woman there told me how proud she was of the building and that it would, had been built by the German prisoners of war and thus was of superior quality to standard other Soviet buildings. Um, and so it's known in these cities what buildings were built by the German prisoners of war. The main building of Moscow State University, for example, one of Stalin's neo-Gothic Seven Sisters skyscrapers, was partially built by German prisoners of war. So this is not, these, these men, these captives were not cut off. They were not remote. They were not freezing to death in the tundra for no reason. Which, which is already deviating from the idea. You know, I watched um, The Way Back with Ed Harris and Colin Farrell a few few weeks ago just because it just made its way to the top of my Blu-ray list and watched it. And it's the standard trope of, you know, you're, in, you're, you're thousands of miles from anywhere. No one knows you're here. There's no civilization anywhere. And, and that is... That's the, 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 the ongoing image of the gulags. And also our very knowledgeable audience have picked up on the fact that not only are these the population centers, they're the places that saw the most destruction as well. You, you need, yep. You're obviously going to be coming to that. They're, 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 someone said there's nothing to rebuild in Siberia. I mean, snow, snowmen, possibly, you know, damage <laughs> to snowmen. Um, I'm being facetious. But yeah, it's, it's, it, it, I love this, the, 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 the fact we're challenging what our perceptions are. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, and uh, if I go back a slide too, just based on the comments of Siberia and, and, and whatnot that, that have come up in the chat too, I mean, if you look at this map, you'll notice that yes, there are camps in Siberia, but the ones that are in Siberia are along the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and they are in uh, the industrial centers of Siberia, predominantly, especially along the Urals mountain range, which is the dividing line uh, between European and Asian Russia, or the dividing line between uh, Russia and Siberia, however you want to phrase it. Mm. Uh, and the Urals is where a lot of industry was evacuated to during the Second World War. Factories were torn down and shipped, uh, what is it, north, south, east, eastwards, so that they couldn't be bombed during the fighting and, and, and keep producing. It's also the center of the steel industry, for example. Uh, and there's some coal basins sort of in that area as well. And so prisoners of war are working in industries that are vital for reconstruction. If they're not physically rebuilding the cities, they're mining the coal that's needed to uh, run locomotives, to, to produce steel. They're in the steel factories or they're rebuilding steel factories or building additional steel factories and so on and so forth. So the mapping really helps to understand the economic uh, contribution of the prisoners of war without having some of the statistics that I wish I could have. So this is where, again, digital history allows you to do a new spin on something traditional or to, to take a traditional source that doesn't necessarily tell answer the question you need it to answer. But if you re-examine it in a different way or put it in conversation with some other sources, you get new answers. Um, and another example of that is by looking at the camps in relation to the climate data as well. So this is the average January temperature in Russia. Unfortunately, it's just for the Russian Republic. But as you can see, the German prisoner of war camps are not in the harshest temperature regions of Russia. They're not in the harshest temperature regions of the Soviet Union. There were a handful of gulag camps in those places, again, because the Soviet Union needed to use them as um, essentially an internal colonizing force to send people to extract resources from places where people did not want to live, free citizens. But the prisoners, the German prisoners, who were legitimate prisoners, not war criminals who were sentenced to gulag camps, there were some. Uh, there is a distinction in my work between the war criminals and the regular soldiers who were held as prisoners of war. I don't really look at the war criminals. Again, that's also something that's very restricted and that I can't get access to. Um, but if a German says that they had been in one of the gulag camps, if they were in a legitimate gulag, that's because they were tried and sentenced and convicted of having committed a war crime on the territory of the Soviet Union and were sent to serve out their sentence as a uh, regular criminal uh, in the Soviet Union. In other aspects, like in all other ways, the regular prisoners of war were in their own prisoner of war camps. They were not in gulag camps. They were segregated. And 
because they were segregated, they were assigned to some nicer, more temperate regions of the Soviet Union. Now, um, I've presented this research to Germans before, and a lot of them are struck by how the camps are not in Siberia. Um, there are a lot of occurrences where if I've been in Germany to, do, to conduct research, you're just talking to somebody like an Airbnb host, they'll say, oh yes, my, my so-and-so, my grandfather, my great uncle, my cousin, blah, 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 was a captive in the Soviet Union. And then I ask, well, where? And they always, almost always answer Siberia. Mm. But my mapping work has showed that it shouldn't necessarily be Siberia. I think it's something like only 13% of the camps out of the entire Soviet Union were in Siberia. So it shouldn't be the dominant answer. I've also looked at the camps. There are problems with the statistics or information about the camp population. Um, but I've done some mapping analysis with uh, sort of an average figure for the camp capacity. And if you look at the maps, again, by population weight, they're in the population centers, the industrial centers, and not Siberia. And so I've really wanted, I've, I've gone down the sidekick to, to try to understand the origins of this trope of Siberian captivity, especially for the Germans. And so I thought, why don't I start with German prisoner of war memoirs? There, there are plenty of German prisoner of war memoirs. They've been published in West Germany, East Germany, reunified Germany, the United States, and so on and so forth in uh, generally German or English. So I spent a considerable amount of time uh, scanning about 35 of them. And then I digitized them so that I had a text corpus and I worked with a programmer and he helped me search for any instance of a place name from that uh, encyclopedia of camps that I had of German uh, prisoner of war camps. And so I said, hey, here's a list of potential places where they could have been. Read through these texts and tell me which text and where in that text it talks about that place so that I could then go in and uh, look at those places and map them as well. And so I did that. I mapped the places named in the German prisoner of war memoirs. And again, not surprisingly, or surprisingly, I guess, the majority of the camps were not in Siberia, the ones that the prisoners reference. Um, and there are even a couple in really remote parts of Siberia that you'll see on the map uh, in the north and in the east. And that's because those prisoners, because I did the text analysis, I could say, hey, show me where in that memoir that that guy mentions Vorkuta, or show me where in that... Um, memoir that guy mentions Kalima. And I'd go and I'd read the context and the prisoners themselves were not in these infamous gulag locations. They were referencing having had a discussion with somebody who had been to the gulag or they, they were referencing being told that they should um, behave in the camp or else they would be sent to one of these horrible places in Siberia. So then where did this come from? And it turns out that the memoirs themselves were also really helpful for figuring out where uh, this myth came from, this trope of Siberian captivity. And one of the things that came up in a handful of the memoirs was a semi-autobiographical novel called The Forgotten Village, uh, Four Years in Siberia by Theodore Kroger. And um, this novel uh, tells the story of a prisoner of war held in Siberia at the end of the First World War. During World War I, the majority of the Germans captured by the Tsarist Russian forces were held in camps in Siberia. And so memoir and novel literature that was written in the interwar year, years heavily referenced this. And so there was a preconceived notion that if one were captured, one would go to Siberia. And even one of the novelists, uh, uh, excuse me, even one of the memoirists noted that himself, right? So uh, former POW Helmut Gullwitzer said, we felt that we had been written off, we were forgotten, and we would remain missing. Many of us had read Kroger's novel, The Forgotten Village, and drew from it parallels of our destiny, the, the, the destiny that they'd be going to Siberia. But in fact, there are many instances in the Prisoner of War memoirs that mention the word Siberia. If you search the word Siberia, and they would say, we were captured, we were put onto a train, we thought, surely we're going to Siberia, and then, lo and behold, we were not in Siberia. We were somewhere else. We were outside of Leningrad. We were in Armenia, and so on and so forth. So this novel was uh, very popular in interwar Germany. About 450,000 copies of it were sold between 1934 and 19. 1939 alone, and so it heavily 
uh, conditioned these young men into thinking that they'd be going to Siberia. And certainly it also conditioned their families that these men would be going to Siberia. The concept of Siberia was also uh, a result of wartime Nazi propaganda. Um, the Nazis had a wartime slogan, Sieg oder Siberien, victory or Siberia. As the Red Army continued to be more effective after the Battle of Stalingrad, Nazi propaganda played up um, this slogan. It was painted on buildings across Germany. And so for soldiers, especially those who were drafted later, and for those civilians living on the home front, again, there's this um, message that if Russia, if the Soviet Union wins, we will wind up in Siberia. If people are captured, if Germans are captured, they will go to Siberia. Just another example of it painted again on another building and again, right? So it, it was prevalent, right? It wasn't just something that happened only once. Now, the trope of Siberia too doesn't stop with the end of the Second World War. As I mentioned, the last of the prisoners are only returned in 1956. So there are many years after the war where families are wondering where their uh, relatives are. Some of this is due to the fact that the Soviet officials didn't sign the Geneva Convention. So uh, for a long time, captives in the Soviet Union didn't have the, the, the right to correspond home. So families didn't know if their relatives were missing in action, killed in action, or dead. There are also problems with Wehrmacht accounting during the final stages of the war. Um, the Wehrmacht intentionally downplayed the numbers of casualties so that people would continue to fight the war. The Soviet officials also didn't allow the Red Cross into the Soviet Union to investigate the camps or send rosters of those in captive home. So there was a lot of missing information that led people to think that their relatives were alive and in missing camps or secret camps. And it was commonly thought that these secret or missing camps were in Siberia. Um, and these missing camps and the question of who was in the Soviet Union and when they would come home became very, very, very heavily politicized in the burgeoning Cold War between what would become West Germany and East Germany and the Soviet Union. And one of the main uh, agitators for this within West Germany was Konrad Adenauer, the man who would become uh, chancellor of West Germany. He rose to national political dominance partially because of a campaign policy of questioning and trying to return uh, the German prisoners of war. And he also had these notions that the German prisoners of war, especially those who were in uh, the communi evil communist uh, Soviet Union, were victims not only of Nazism, but were victims of uh, communism, of Stalinist repression. Adenauer sort of had a philosophy, a policy of sort of uh, ignoring some of the crimes of the past and moving on. The German prisoners of war were perfect candidates to be rebranded as victims and to, to show that Germans too had suffered during the Second World War and had suffered as a, as a result of Nazism. And so in the early 1950s, there were a series of laws that were passed uh, that were POW Compensation Acts. And they were widely popular. Uh, and the Compensation Act basically stated that if you were a prisoner of war, it didn't really matter the country. It could have been in America or England or France. Um, but if you were a prisoner of war, you were entitled to some sort of compensation for the time that you had spent in captivity. Obviously, this was much more important for the Soviet Union, where men were held for far, far longer than the other uh, nations, uh, and uh, where men were still continued to be detained. The notion, again, um, is further cemented when the final returnees come back in October of 1955. It's a problem for East Germany, because East Germany, because they were allied with the Soviet Union, they had to follow a linguistic shift that the Soviet Union used in 1949 that said, uh, well, let me dial it back a second. At the end of the Second World War, all of the Allied victor nations agreed to return their final prisoners of war by December 31st of 1948, right? There was an agreement. You can keep the captives for a little bit after the Second World War. Everybody, especially on the territory of Europe, needs to rebuild. It's understandable that able-bodied men could be used for reconstruction efforts. but. 19, the end of 1948 was sort of the end of what was seen as an acceptable uh, amount of time for that. In January of 1949, 
The Soviet Union releases a press release and they say suddenly, we don't have any prisoners of war, we only have war criminals. Now, not everybody in the Soviet Union at that time after 1949 was a war criminal, but East Germany had to follow this linguistic shift in its press. And so at some point it sort of gives up the public championing and the public hope of the return of the last of the prisoners of war. Because it's okay for a prisoner of war to return, but a war criminal is a completely different class of person. Mm. It's a war criminal. You understand that a war criminal should be paying some sort of, like, like, should be serving out some sort of punishment for the atrocities they committed. So uh, Konrad Adenauer goes to the Soviet Union in September of 1955. Nikita Khrushchev is now in charge of the Soviet Union. This is after Stalin's death. And Khrushchev is trying to act pra pragmatically with Adenauer. West Germany had just joined NATO and Khrushchev was terrified of this. And so he was looking for some ways to better relations between West Germany and the Soviet Union. At the time, neither states had uh, fully normalized diplomatic relations, right? So the Western powers didn't recognize East Germany as a country uh, and the Eastern powers didn't recognize West Germany as a country. Khrushchev thought that if he invited Adenauer over and they normalized relations, things might be better between the two of them, smooth some of the tensions. Adenauer refused to agree to do anything unless the final men were returned. And there was a lot, a lot, a lot of negotiation back and forth, and Khrushchev eventually relented because the point of normalizing relations and having better diplomacy in light of the Cold War was far more important than the questions of whether or not the remaining men truly were war criminals or were just regular prisoners. And so the final men start coming back in October of 1955. The last of them, for a variety of reasons, come back in January of 1956. In West Germany, there is some public celebration of this return. Um, in East Germany, there's an awkward situation where they can't really celebrate the return because these men had been branded as war criminals and were thus like lost causes, people that mm. you didn't really need to care about returning. There's this fanfare though in West Germany and again, there are thoughts that these men, like in press clippings and things like that, they say that they're returning from Siberia, despite the fact that they weren't all returning from Siberia. The last men return in 1956. The trope doesn't die in 1956, though. If anything, it's made uh, stronger and cemented by television and cinema in uh, West Germany. So there was a very popular book that was published in 1955 called As Far As My Feet Will Carry Me. It was allegedly the true story of a German prisoner of war's escape from a Siberian gulag, and then it was turned into a uh, television series that was widely popular in both East and West Germany. Then in 1961, there was the very subtly titled uh, The Devil Played Balalaika. Um, so it's associating the devil with uh, the, so one of the national folk instruments of the Soviet Union of Russia. And again, the beginning of the movie labels it, labels the setting solely as Siberia, right? So if there are cinematic representations of these stories, the setting is ultimately always Siberia. So people think, right? They're conditioned to think that it was Siberia, even though it wasn't the case. And this even continued in, uh, until recent times, although I guess it's getting further and further away from 2003 than I would like to admit. Um, but there's this very popular movie uh, called uh, The Miracle of Bern. It came out in 2003. It's about the 1954 West German World Cup soccer, vi excuse me, football victory. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get my audience right. International audience, it's football. Um, the, the main plot is about the team winning, but there's a subplot to the film about this young boy and his father, Richard, who was a late returnee who came back in 1954. And again, the plot talks about how this late returnee came back explicitly from Siberia. So even for a younger generation who hasn't necessarily lived with this, if you're a younger person, you're watching this movie that's still wildly popular, you're again going to associate Soviet captivity with Siberia. Uh, and so I don't think that's necessarily going to go away anytime soon, but I was just really curious about what some of the roots were of this um, and perhaps why some of this, there's, there's this discrepancy between what was actually happening in the Soviet Union and uh, with how Germans and other people uh, remember this situation. Um, 
So that's about it that I have on the slides. I had just one more with, uh, if you were interested in this Siberia um, trope, I have an article published on it. So there's a lot more information in depth if you want to take a look at that and really take time to read through, look at the different sources, look at some of the memoirs I looked at, and so on and so forth. There's even a bibliography in there uh, of the memoirs that I use. So if you're, you want to read former German prisoner of war memoirs, there's a delightful list of them in there in English and German. Um, and that's it that I have in terms of a presentation, but I would love to open this up more so into a discussion about yeah, German prisoners of war. Well, thank you. Brilliant. I mean, it's people are already saying this is brilliant. I'm thinking it's already one of my favorite shows I've done for a long time. Um, History Underground, that's JD from his, uh, History Underground, just come back from working on the Ukraine borders, saying, maybe a dumb question, but I wonder if all of the German POWs actually knew where they were. If I got dumped off, say, in some camp and it was cold, I'd assume that it was in Siberia. And that, that would connect, I would think, with this pre-war, the novel you talked about. If you don't know where you are and it's cold, your assumption is Siberia. Is there any, is there any truth in that, do you think? I think there is some truth. Well, yes and no. So... There is truth that they might not necessarily know where places were, whether they were in Siberia or not. But the memoirs and a lot of the uh, returnee interviews, so there are interviews conducted by, say, the German Red Cross, the German Catholic Relief Organization, the German Protestant Relief Organization. Those are unpublished um, returnee interviews. The soldiers knew where the camps were. They often had the names right. of the camps. They had a camp name. They had a camp number. Sometimes if you only had the camp number, you wouldn't necessarily know where the camp was, but they pretty much always had a location name that they could give with the camp. And okay, yeah, maybe your Soviet geography is not very good and you don't necessarily know where Ulyanovsk is, for example, right? And maybe that's okay for you to just say, yeah, I was in Ulyanovsk, it was in Siberia. Or maybe you go back and you look at a map and you see where it was and see whether it was in Siberia or not. Or it could also be something to do with the traumas of the war and captivity. So the word Siberia carries a lot of weight. It carries a lot of mental imagery. It's carried mental imagery. And I talk about this in my article in Europe and America for a very long time, partially because there was a czarist history of sending mm -hmm. exiles and, and uh, criminals to Siberia. It was, you know, the, the wild, wild west of Russia, uh, a, a vast, untamed land. Um, some people may have just found it easier to say, I was in Siberia, and that would stop any sort of discussion if they felt uncomfortable or something like that, right? Like, your family doesn't know where Ulyanovsk is, so it might just be easier to say, I was in Siberia. They leave it at that. They don't question you about it. And they, they have that mental image. You're able to say, well, I did have a terrible experience. It was cold. There was a lack of food. There was a lot of manual labor. I'm just going to say that and full stop, you leave me alone. I, I can see that, that you know, if you're looking for work and you're looking for sympathy for an employee and the, an employer, that, you know, you, you throw in that reference there. You know, if you're, que you know, you're queuing up some kind of veterans administration type thing and you're, it's 1959, you're German, you've got troubles with your you know your gout or something and you're trying to get you know you drop in the, yeah i was in siberia of course you might just get to the head of the queue a little bit more you might from a german you know, whether it's east germany or west germany you might just get some recognition of of sympathy there that would gain you that so that that makes some sense to me that people would say it for simplistic reasons the other thing i'm going to say then we'll open it to questions is well as an i always bring things back to normally because that's where the hell i live is that we as tour guides are always getting told emails people say my grandfather was on utah beach for on d-day and then they give the unit that he was in and it turns out he was on utah beach but he landed in the middle of beginning of july and and what has happened is is the veteran has passed away he always told his family i landed on utah beach but then the family have added the D-Day bit themselves. to it. The veteran himself never said that. They've added that after his death. And then you explain to people, now actually 836,000 men came ashore on Utah Beach, 21,000 on D-Day. So only actually 2.5% of anyone who ever came ashore on Utah would have done so on D-Day. And you're telling families that and they go, oh, so I can see in this case, I'm assuming the mortality rates of people coming back from these camps in 56, they're going to be dying quite young. I'm, I'm going to make that, uh, they're not, it's obviously some would live to be 95, but a lot because of the 
the the the conditions and working hard and the fact that you know they've been in combat i'm seeing a lot of them are dying in their 50s and 60s and maybe early 70s so i can see that family members then are adding oh yes because great uncle friedrich was in a prisoner of the railway of siberia i can see them adding that because of that's the name they recognize right or if that's what they saw in the movie so they oh, never they, spoke yeah, to him about the it movies, but they the knew they that yeah he was there he he suffered obviously he must have been in siberia yeah yeah well We'll do a few questions, um, uh, and then, well, because well, that's fun. Um, Pat is asking, what happened to the POWs, Italian, Hungarian, Romanian, et cetera? Were they held for as long? Um, not always as long. Um, uh, so for a variety of reasons, I organized my study about around the Germans, uh, partially because I speak German, I don't speak Italian, Romanian, and so on and so forth, so I can't engage with that literature. Uh, I Oh, I don't think any of the rest of them were held until 1956, except for the Japanese prisoners. Well, so Grant, Italian... Grant Harewood is saying the Romanians did also oh, the Roman... came back okay. in 56. So Grant, Grant, who's our Romanian expert, is saying that that's when the Madrid M came Hi, back. So that, thank, well done, Grant. So, um, yeah, um, I think we've addressed that one. Sorry, I can't cut you off there a bit. No, um, but... Um... There's just a book that came out, uh, well, it came out a few years ago in Italian. It was just translated into English. It's about the, the Italian prisoners of war, and it's called, I think, Stalin's Prisoners, Italian Prisoners of War in the Soviet Union. Um, so that's a good book to look at for that. Uh, and there just was published a book about the Japanese prisoners of war in the Soviet Union in English called 11 Winters of Discontent. Right. Okay. We have a question here from Jay White, and I'm not sure quite where, 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 where this is coming from as such, but mm. well-researched and informative. Any thoughts on the low percentage of Stalingrad prisoner survival re repatriation? Now, I, I didn't know that was necessarily something that was commonly thought. So Jay knows something I don't know there. And is that connected with the fact that Stalingrad for the, for the Soviets was this, again, we're going back to this revenge punishment thing, was there much more symbolic? So if, if you were German captured there, you were somehow perceived as worse than if you were captured in summer. Or oh, is that where Jay's going with this? No, he's going with that because Stalingrad is the major turning point uh, for the right. Red Army, or one of the major turning points. But it's the one where they have the victory at Stalingrad, and then they transition from uh, defensive fighting to really offensive fighting, right? And they Stalingrad, they hold their ground, they stop the Nazis, they defeat the Sixth Army, and then they march their way towards Berlin. Right. Stalingrad is infamous because I think it's something like 91,000 German prisoners are taken at that battle alone. And there's a very, very high death rate of those prisoners. Off the top of my head, I can't remember um, the numbers, but a very a large number of them die. Right. A large number of them die not necessarily due to Soviet intention and planning, or rather, I mean, a lot of it was a lack of planning. Uh, they didn't necessarily think that they would be taking that many men. So their camp system was overwhelmed. Um, it was already heavily taxed. And now all of a sudden they had 91,000 men that they had to feed, clothe, and so on and so forth. The other issue has to do with the battle itself, right? So the Sixth Army gets encircled at Stalingrad. Paulus is given a handful of, um, uh, he's offered a few times to surrender and he declines to surrender a few times, right? And so the battle continues to linger. The men then are suffering from the cold and from starvation, from disease, from wounds for longer and longer and longer. So had Paulus surrendered sooner, more of the prisoners probably would have survived because the ones who were taken were in such bad physical shape that you know they just couldn't survive after having the frostbite. They couldn't survive right. after having yeah. starved or been on starvation rations for so long. Okay, that makes sense. Um... I found another question. I've lost it again now, and it's from Grant, in fact. And it's oh, that was it. And how did Lendlease impact condition on POWs? Um, so I don't know too, too, too much about this topic, but it has come up in German prisoner of war memoirs um, that, like, in at least one memoir or uh, returnee interview, something like that, the soldiers mentioned having consumed rations that had been provided via lend lease. Right. I mean, I wonder whether there's any kind of like, you know, we know that the, the, the Allied prisoners of war of the Germans would receive the Red Cross passes, whether there was any within Lend, someone who's bound to be watching this who, under, who knows more about Lend-Lease, whether there was any provision made during Lend-Lease that 
food was sent and it sort of said on it, this is specifically for prisons. I don't know whether there, any kind of such um, provision was made, but someone's bound to know that. Um, any forget. other questions, folks, for coming? And I'm, I've, I've got some more things I want to uh, want to say, but this the 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 the, the the trope is really fascinating. I mean, I, and I think you're right. I think it's not going to go away now. And I and I, I think it's, if you're a filmmaker, certainly, you know, you're starting your opening shot and you've got the, you know, you, you've got the soundtrack, the the whistling wind starts up there. Then the snow vista comes in and you see the barbed wire and you see snow or ice on the barbed wire and you see prisoners huddle, whether you're setting it in the 40s or even, you know, more recently in Soviet history, that is going to be the way of immediately establishing where you are and what the movie stroke TV series is going to be about. So I can't see that really changing anytime too. I think showing people kind of stripped the waste building um, industrial facilities uh, near a major city wouldn't work in, in that visual way. So I, I can't see that changing. Um, I'll just think there should we have some more questions in now. Um, Andrew Routledge, was part of the reason they decided to keep these POW for so long to try and rebuild due to refusing the Marshall Plan aid, or has that got nothing to do with it? That's certainly got something to do with it, right? And in the immediate post-war era, right, there's this, this Stalin is not on good terms with the Western allies. He doesn't want to come across as weak, right? right? That's one of the reasons why he refuses the Marshall Plan aid. He doesn't want the Western allies to know how bad the destruction was in the Soviet Union. As I mentioned, it's only in the Gorbachev era that we have the actual or uh, a much higher estimate of the deaths, right? Stalin announces some much, much lower number. I think it might have been 10 million citizens died during the Second World War or perhaps even fewer than that. Because there were no, because of the lack of laborers, right? 27 million citizens. There's a lot of people to not work in the factories. You have 7 million men who die. That is a massive demographic shift as well. You're not going to have other citizens born who would have been born. There's a famine that kills off other people as well in 46, 47. Um, there's just that much destruction. The Soviets needed any able-bodied person to contribute to reconstruction. Mm, you know, yeah, um, yeah, that sounds reasonable to me. I mean, the next I was going to say about is um, I'm going to put that slide back up again where you said about the, the one about the 15 year. Where's the one about the 15 year? The quote about 15. You know, it's your there. Yeah, 20, 25 years. years. Yeah. So um, you you know the we talked you talked about Khrushchev and the the 56 the deal to send the prisoners back. Uh, that's that's an estimate an estimation of how long it would take. What's your feeling about where? The, the Soviets were in 56 in their use of, of the, the POW workforce? I mean, how, were they further ahead with their rebuilding than they think? Were they still a long way away? Because I'm not saying that would have influenced their decision to send them back. As you said, the political reasons for that are clear and obvious. But do you have any kind of sense on where they were in their rebuilding by then? No, that's a great question, too, because at that point, the prisoners are, by 56, there are only about 10, 12,000 prisoners, war criminals, however they're being branded, allegedly, in the Soviet Union. Uh, the majority of the men are returned or die by, I think, 49, 50. Um, that's also around the completion of the, it's the fourth five-year plan. The fourth five-year plan was for the reconstruction of the Soviet Union after the Second World War. Now, the Soviet Union is not completely reconstructed by 1949, but by 1953, around Stalin's death, the Soviet Union has reached and is just starting to like overtake its pre-war levels of economic right. production. So, it's, it's, so by 56, okay. there's less of um, an economic. There's less of an economic need. There's also less of an economic need by well, 49, 56, that sort of range as well, because. Um, during the Second World War, there were high death rates in the Gulag. There were also massive amnesties from the Gulag in the sense that um, people were allowed to leave the Gulag to join the Red Army to fight. After the Second World War, there is again a massive post-war repression. And so the Gulag population, which had uh, declined severely during the war, again continued to increase in size. So if anything, the immediate prisoners of war they're filling this gap, they're plugging the hole in the uh, forced labor contingent in the Soviet Union, because gulag people down, prisoners of war up. As the prisoners of war decrease, the gulag is increasing. So there's like a inverse 
curve to those yeah. two um, populations. So they're, the German prisoners of war are less important because there are more people who are arrested and sent to forced labor enterprises uh, from the free Soviet population. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Scott Grimwood is just re asking for a reminder of the figures. So how many, So you said it was 3 million uh, uh, German, that was specifically German rather than Romanian Italians that were there at, the, at one point. And then we know that some came back in 56. But so so what the, what, what, what are the figures for repatriation? And that can be gradually or in 56. You, I think you gave them, but just to recap them. Uh, is, so capitulation, there are 3 million Germans. By December of 45, there are roughly a million and a half Germans. Those million and a half either die off or repatriated uh, up to about 56, where it, it, 55, 56, there are about 10, 12,000 left. Right. The figures are really, really, really fuzzy. Really fuzzy. Um, I haven't been able to read any of the Soviet numbers. Uh, for a variety of political reasons. Uh, there are also people who have done work on the Gulag have learned that Soviet officials were encouraged to lie with some of their death statistics. Um, mm. So assessing any sort of death statistic in a Soviet camp situation is nearly impossible. Um, so in the Gulag, for example, if a prisoner died in Camp A, they were a death statistic for Camp B. However, if they were in a train in transit to Camp B, they didn't die in Camp A, they didn't die in Camp B, their death statistic disappeared. So there was this really high practice of taking really ill or injured prisoners and sort of shipping them around so that they wouldn't count against the camps. Because camps weren't supposed to have people die, right? It's not a death camp. You're supposed to sustain the labor and the prisoner, be it, uh, well, at least in the Gulag, the prisoner, if he was somebody who could be redeemed, was supposed to redeem himself through labor. All right. In the German prisoner of war camp situation as well, they didn't want the Germans to die. They needed them for the labor. Okay. So I'm going to go back to something you said earlier, because you talked about this idea of in the, the population areas, uh, Soviets seeing prisoners, you know, the, the equivalent of chain gangs is the, is the analogy I'm going to make there. So because, you know, if you, if you grew up in Alabama or Mississippi or Florida in a certain era of the 20th century, chain gangs were part of something you saw there. So you're saying that in these population areas, Moscow and other cities, that, that, that seeing German POWs and work camps was a very normal thing. So what, what mm -hmm. I'm, or, uh, it's fairly normal. So we can therefore assume that the Gulag Siberia idea doesn't, take root in the Soviet Union because they, they knew it wasn't because they are seeing them all over. So it has to be outside of the Soviet Union, the, the site, the idea of the camps being in Siberia. So it must have taken root in Germany and spread from there. Is that what we're concluding? When I say yeah. we, I'm taking credit for well, your work there. What are you all concluding? I'll add you as a co-author on the revised version That'd of the That'd be piece. great. Thank yes. you. Um, no, yeah, um, it's, it's, this is really happening predominantly in Western Europe and the United States. And it's certainly, certainly helped um, by the anti-communist politics of the Cold War, of West Germany, of NATO, of the United States. Um, even the, the dissident gulag literature that we have that really uh, furthered this trope in the United States, for example. Solzhenitsyn's most famous work, the Gulag Archipelago, was smuggled out of the Soviet Union. It could not be um, produced in the Soviet Union. The CIA, I believe, helped get it published and distributed in translation abroad. Right. OK. Um, Andrew is asking again, and I'm going to word it slightly differently, about the use of POW success. I mean, in your research, again, do you think it really made much of a dent in it? In the, you know, if if they're, they're prisoners of war by the, you know, you know, we talked about the Stalingrad ones. They are may, maybe in fairly poor health. They're for poor morale. They're not the most efficient workforce. They're not being fed the most, uh, although, you, as you're saying, there's, there's food shortages all over the place. So do you think it is really making a difference in the Soviet rebuilding process? Is it was it was it worth that that expenditure? You said 4000 camps, you said at one point. Well, so, that, they weren't necessarily all operating at the same time, but yeah, there were yeah, yeah, yeah. 4,000 roughly discrete camps that operated between 41 and 56. Because they have to be constructed. They've got to be guarded. They need wire. They need huts. They need heating. They need electricity. They need all that stuff. There. So there's an infrastructure that has to be set up to create them. And then yep. the, there's the work that the people from these camps are then doing. So so did, did it make a dent? 
I would say yes, um, just by the sheer numbers alone. So right. if you look at the reports to Stalin and the other top officials from 46, for, a, for example, that explain the prisoner of war breakdown in the various commissariats, you have a couple hundred thousand working in the coal industry, for example. I mean, maybe that's only a, a small percentage of the number of people working in the coal industry, but two, three hundred thousand people seems to me like a large number of people. There's also, uh, I mean, there's always an argument about whether slave labor, if you want to call it that, or prison labor or free labor, whether one is more productive than the other. Yeah, it's also questionable. Soviets tried to get around this, though, in a certain way, in that your rations were based on your labor output. So you only got 100% of your ration norm if you fulfilled 100% of your labor norm. Mm. If you only fulfilled, say, 75% of your uh, assigned labor tasks, you were supposed to receive a reduced ration. All right, so they are incentivized to produce at a level that they're supposed to produce at. The Soviet Union also had a culture that was started with the first five-year plan of meeting and exceeding the quota. So if you met your if you exceeded the labor quota by a certain point, you were entitled to extra food, or sometimes you were entitled to a shot of vodka. Like I've seen that written into the supplemental um, ration documents. Um, the Russians themselves, the Soviet, well, I say the Russians because I've only spoken to citizens of modern day Russia about this. There are obviously different republics. They might have different thoughts in those other republics, but the people who I've spoken to in Russia who have had family members who have interacted with this, they have fond memories of the labor produced by the Germans. As I mentioned, there was the woman at the university in Ulyanovsk who was very um, boastful about the building because it had been built by the Germans. That's not mm. a singular experience. Many Russians have told me that if it was a building produced by the Germans, it was of higher quality. Mm. Whether or not it was of higher quality because well, it was, was still using the same yeah. Soviet materials, the perception is it's German built, it's better. Wow, that's that's interesting as well, isn't it? Um, so we had a couple of questions, various people come, uh, talking about the fact that in your research, and obviously it's beyond the scope of your research, there will also be people out there who are Americans and British because there are people liberated in various camps. But it's obviously with, with the million, hundreds of thousands of German period, they are a tiny, tiny percentage. But just to, I'll, I'll ask you the question. You obviously came across accounts of non-Axis prisoners being held, but I guess not enough to make a dent in your research for what you're trying to do. Yeah, I've seen the numbers. So the way that the Russian state military archive worked uh, and they have all of the central or allegedly all of the central documents uh, for the uh, prisoner of war administration. And there are some central document files, but then the majority of the files are organized by either the main camp or even sub camps. So there are literally thousands and tens of thousands of files to look at. I focused on some of the files from Ulyanovsk, for example, because it was a smaller camp, it ran for a shorter amount of time, and I know the city. So I figured I could sort of decipher some of that information better. Um, I looked at some other camps too, say Stalingrad, because I knew it was a key city, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't think this was the case in Ulyanovsk, but, and I, I don't want to say Stalingrad, I don't want to say which camp it was, because I can't remember off the top of my head, but I have seen... Uh, they did uh, accountings of the population, and so they said, we have X number of Germans, X number of Finns, X number of Romanians, X number of French, X number of American, and so on and so forth. So every once in a while, you would find a Frenchman, uh, an American, uh, but I didn't have any other contextual documents that told me how or why those men wound up there. Allegedly, every single person who was a prisoner of war in the Soviet Union should have had a, uh, uh, an ID card. Um, I know that they exist because the Hungarian government a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, something like that, purchased at great cost all of the individual personnel files from the Russian government. And they are currently in the process of digitizing these files so that Hungarian citizens can get the record of their, you know, their great grandfather, their grandfather, uncle and so on and so forth. OK, cool. So my next question is going to be kind of a, a future one, really, because You've done this amazing work, and the and, and the bit that most impressed me, amongst all of it that impressed me, was the digital scanning of those thirty-five books, and then the cross-referencing of the place names. That just like that, that is even possible, uh, <laughs> kind of blows my mind. So brilliant for that. But the, but what's the next stage with where your research can be used by others? I'm thinking about people like Adam Tooze and his look at the economy of Germany and Sean McMeekin and what this means for, you know, the, the understanding of, of, of the Soviet Union. So because this is a this is a, is a small 
subject that's a big subject that you've studied but it what i'm saying is there's obviously more work to be done in in understanding the economy of post patriotic war soviet union that will help us understand the post war period but also we can take it back to understand more of the red army's um failures and successes because we still we talked about it yesterday with um with Voyan, we still it's all about T-34 tanks and and which aircraft did this. And there's a there's a whole lot more as to, to the, the reasons for victory there. So what do you think people can be using your research for is my basically the question. Uh, that is a phenomenal question. Uh, I do not have a particularly great answer. But I, I don't want to tell people necessarily how to use my work, um, but I I do want to. So I have a book under contract. It will hopefully be coming out in, what is it, the end of, middle of, end of 2023, if I'm getting it right. right. Uh, that is kind of like a lot of what I talked about, minus the Siberia work. The Siberia work is that offshoot article. Um, but I have chapters that focus on life in the camps, labor in the camps, anti-fascist re-education in the camps. There was a huge anti-fascist re-education program. Um, the politics of repatriation and then commemoration of the German prisoners of war on uh, Soviet and then Russian soil. So I think there are a lot of different angles for people who are interested in World War II economics, the post-war home front, uh, or even the, the wartime home front in the Soviet Union. Um, I think there really aren't even that many works on that as well. There's a lot of research yet to be done. I just am hesitant to say about how any of that's gonna turn out, what with the current situation. Um, well, that's, that's, I'm not yeah, sure. That's, uh... So, so as I mentioned, my sources, some of them were declassified, some of them are still classified. The ones that are still classified, I don't think necessarily will ever be declassified, right? Because there are political implications to releasing information about death statistics, for example. Mm -hmm. Some of these other World War II things, it might not be possible to continue to research them. Um, my sources were in the Russian State Military Archive, miraculously. That archive is only supposed to have documents for up to 1941. My hunch is that my documents are all there because my prisoner of war administration was formed in 1939 uh, around uh, like Molotov, Ribbentrop, and then the Winter War with Finland. All of the other World War II documents, 41 to present, are housed by the Ministry of Defense Military Archive, and foreigners are not allowed to research there. And I think it's even very difficult for Russian citizens to research there. Uh, mm. So there might continue to be a crackdown on this topic. For the past couple of years, there's been a crackdown on this topic. Uh, you're not allowed to say certain things about the Second World War in Russia. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily have an optimistic outlook for the ability to do this research that really needs to be done on uh, other aspects of the Red Army or, or the home front population during and after the Second World yeah, War. Yeah, uh, and that's the, that's the effect of modern times. I mean, Rolf is asking, I'm changing the subject a bit, he's asking about the, the, the war crimes in the prisoner camps. But I would suggest that's actually the bit we do know a bit about because of these famous books we've had, you know, the barbarity and things like that. That is probably the, 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 the mini societal experience of these camps is, I think, well covered. I mean, it's mostly... Negative in the negative, the information we are. I would, I would, I would assume that probably the day to day life isn't quite as horrible as the accounts that we get that we have come out there because they they couldn't be dying every day with people stabbing each other because the the work wouldn't be wouldn't be getting done. And as you said, there it's all about this efficiency of trying to get this the rebuilding process done. So I assume we have a slightly more negative idea of that. But um, well, I, I don't uh, mean it to come across like that? it was a, a country club or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Exactly. It certainly was yes, a terrible yeah. experience to be in one of those camps. Um, but there's also just, there's a difference between being in one of those camps and having at least some modicum of Russian rations attempted to be given to yeah. you as opposed to, um, I mean, the Germans like to talk about the punishment of the Germans, uh, like this is retribution for the war. The Nazis had astoundingly worse treatment of the Red Army captives, for example, many of them were just put out into a field and left to starve to death, right? Yeah, so if true. it were an eye for an eye, they wouldn't even be clothed, housed, or fed rations. So... No, definitely. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of conversations going on the sidebar about about this kind of work. But the next thing I'm thinking about, and this again, we, we, we can we can kind of cut this short, is the digital mapping side of things. Because I'm thinking about all the things I've read and about this 
why the Red Army were defending certain cities, because that's where the ball bearings, that's where the oil came from, that's where the train, that's where the tanks came from. I'd like to see someone do the same kind of work you've done with all the books, the military histories, and cross-reference all the towns and the cities and, and look at where actually, for example, bullets were coming from the front line, because it might turn out that some of the areas the Red Army were defending because they thought they were important weren't actually where the the, the, the stuff was coming from. I think they're the tools you are using and Phil Blood are using have much more um, scope than we're currently using them for. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. And honestly, you've touched upon something that I want to do with future research. Should I get like grant funding to do it? Uh, so I mentioned that I digitized that encyclopedia. I yeah. only digitized the 250 pages that are the forced labor camps. Right. There were also reception points, there were filtration camps, there were hospital camps, there are many other camps in that system that I would love to map and put into um, the mapping series, right? Yeah. And see how close the labor camps were to filtration and uh, camps or, or how close were the filtration camps to the reception points and so on and so forth. I also really, really want to do a time series analysis with the front line, right? How quickly do these camps pop up in relation to the movement of the front line? How close are they to the front line? Mm. Technically, per the Geneva Convention, they're not supposed to be that close to the front line. But it's also questionable, too, if you're doing a rebuilding effort, do you want the reconstruction to be that close to the front line? Or are you worried, well, I guess with not one step backwards, you were not worried about taking another step backwards. But um, there, there is there are defensive purposes behind whether or not you move where you you start your reconstruction. Um, so I would really love to digitize some of the great World War II military atlases with the front line, um, with the key battles, and and plot the camps in relation to that. Because when I digitized the encyclopedia, it gives me the opening and closing dates of the camps, so I can do snapshots around key battles, for example, and see where they were. But I really wow. love the comment you made about. You know, where are the tanks made? Where are the supplies coming from? What's the key city for this and that? And how does that play into which cities are defended or not in the strategy? Because, because yes, because in, a, in, a, in, a, in an understanding how the victory was achieved, uh, the, the Siberia camp myth doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating trope, but we're, it's not changing our perception of how World War II was fought and won. But if this digital mapping could work out that actually entire red army fronts were defending at a place that they didn't need to defend they could have put their resources elsewhere because actually the supply lines were were, were, were somewhere that we didn't because we didn't think they were that's that's absolutely fascinating because book after book keeps repeating the, they were defending this because of well stalingrad you know the, the volga the 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 Urals, the, the iron ore that my brain's going off firing in multiple directions now about the potential of what this type of um data study can do to to inform our understanding of exactly how the red army was efficiently or not efficiently waging its war well and you also mentioned a phenomenal source basis that we have we have plenty of tactical maps yeah. um that can be analyzed for that from from both ends right there are plenty of uh nazi military maps that could be deciphered in that way as well no, definitely. But what we're going to do is we're going to end it quite soon because what happens, folks, is I know some of you are saying you can listen to Susan for hours and so could I, is that once the show's done, it's got way more chance of kind of going viral if we keep the length kind of under about under an hour and a half. Because when people are looking at these shows afterwards and they're looking about what shall I watch in between doing the washing up and going to bed, the two and a half hour shows are sometimes a little bit less attractive than the nice kind of tight under an hour and a half one. So I am going to bring things to, to an end now. Um, I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second, Susan. Just remind people what we've got coming sure. up. So tomorrow we have our concluding part of our Eastern Front Week where we are looking at Polish resistance from 1940 to 1944. That's with Dr. Jadwiga Bisk. Kupska. And then next week on Monday, we look at a week of raids and operations. So we're looking at two or three that didn't happen. Operation Foxley, Operation Ruthless didn't happen. Operation Green, the Nazi invasion of Ireland didn't happen. And we're looking at a couple of things that did happen. Uh, we're looking at the LRDG. I haven't put that show up on YouTube, but I will be soon. soon. And we're looking at the, some of the Z Force operations in Borneo with Gavin Mortimer. So there's a little selection of shows coming up you next week so look forward to them but right now i'm going to bring susan back in to just say goodbye basically bring you back in to say goodbye so that was been really good and i knew it was going to be good and we've already had, had a couple ugh, already had a couple people say it's the best show of the week so far so that's really good so so you do well you, you, 
you're, you broke your duck and you've you've hit it out of the park there. I'll use a baseball analogy because you kindly deferred to my football. So I'm going to use a baseball word. So brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, if any people want to follow you on Twitter, they can do that. You've got your own website. They can the details of that are below. If anyone wants to go and read that, um, the, the article you wrote, the report you wrote, they can do that. And I can't wait to find an excuse to bring you back again on something else because I've really enjoyed this. So um, thank you very much for speaking to our, our group of, um, of happy World War II enthusiasts. Thank you very much. This is great. Brilliant. Well, there we are then. So this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. And tomorrow's show is one hour earlier Saturday. So it is at 6 p.m. GMT British time or 7 p.m. in Europe or 1 p.m. EST if you're in the USA. So that's tomorrow. And I'll see everybody then. Cheers, everybody. Bye.